Welcome everybody to our ongoing study of the Gospel of Mark. Today we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 50. That, that's a lot of verses to cover, so we're going to get right to it. Um, first, let me just show you that we've got uh, a plan for the next couple of weeks, and we're going to continue our study through the end of October. After that, we're going to take a break during the months of December, uh, November and December, and then after the first of the year, we'll pick back up with the 11th chapter, the last week of Jesus' life in Mark's Gospel. So, as you see, we've got a lot of verses to cover today, and really what we have are two different stories, or as I call them sometimes, pericopes. So, to cope means to cut, like a coping saw, and peri means around, like the perimeter. So, a pericope is to cut out around a story and lift it up. And we do that every week when we have a, a, a single reading during the worship service rather than reading the whole Gospel of Mark or what have you. Um, today, verses 30 through 50, really is made up of two stories, highly interrelated stories, uh, but I think fairly identifiably different stories. And the first is sometimes represented all by itself in the lectionary. You probably have heard it by itself many times. And that's verses 30 through 37. It's the second occasion on which Jesus tells about going to Jerusalem, suffering, dying, and rising on the third day. Um, and then there's another story that we'll be following, starting in verse 38 and following. And this is uh, about the disciples responding and a teaching that follows. So the first story, we're going to take a little more time with it. We're going to do it the way we've been following stories. I'll read the New Revised Standard Version, and then I'll present my translation verse by verse, and we'll look at it. But the second set of stories, in the interest of time, we're just going to go through the New Revised Standard Version's translation of it, and along the way, I'll make whatever remarks uh, seem appropriate to me. Okay? So, let's get on with the show. Starting with Mark chapter 9, verse 30. Listen for the word of the Lord. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. So this ends the reading of the first part. Uh, now we're going to circle back and look at my translation and just walk through some of the issues in, that each of the verses represents here. Okay? Um, Verse 30, And leaving from there, they passed through Galilee, and he was not wanting that anyone might know. So whenever we have a text that begins with a reference to there, we want to ask there where? Where are we here? And it's a little hard to say precisely where they are in this text. We know that back in chapter 8, it says that Jesus and the disciples went to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and... Uh, after that, we have going up a mountain, down a mountain, joining the crowd, and so forth. But what we don't have are any other specific uh, geographical markings to help us along the way. So we're going to assume they're still in Caesarea Philippi. And uh, now, however, they're passing through Galilee. They're going to end up in Capernaum. And this is going to be the last corpus of stories taking place in Galilee. At the very beginning of chapter 10, we're going to read that they go down into Judea, which is the southern portion of the greater Palestinian area. 
So they're going to be leaving Galilee and not return to, throughout the rest of Mark's gospel. Um, in the next chapter, they're going to be heading toward Jerusalem. Um, and notice this phrase that Jesus didn't want anyone to know. This is not an unusual motif in Mark's gospel. We've seen numerous times where Jesus kind of wants to get away from the crowd. Um, either he wants to be by himself or he wants to be by himself with his disciples and to have a special time with them. We've seen Jesus get up in the middle of the night and go out to a deserted place for prayer. We've seen Jesus go up to a mountain and then summons the disciples to come up to him. Uh, we've seen Jesus, after the disciples come back from their mission trip, say, let's go to a deserted place so you can have rest. And of course, that was interrupted by uh, a crowd meeting them there. Um, we saw Jesus actually leave Galilee and go up to Tyre and Sidon in order to get out of the crowds. And even there, people knew about him, people needed him, and uh, he was not really able to get away from the work. So it's not an unusual motif in Mark's Gospel that Jesus wants to get away, if not for his own rest or the rest of the disciples, at least to teach them. All right? And, and it's very curious why Jesus wants to get away. In verse 31, For he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, The Son of Man is being handed over into human hands, and they will kill him. And having been killed after three days, he will be raised. So when we see a, a verse begin with the word for, um, you can always ask what's that there for, right? And we go back to the last verse, he wanted to get away from the crowds, for he was teaching them about the Son of Man being handed over. Now that's kind of curious, because back in chapter 8, the first time that Jesus disclosed his forthcoming uh, journey to Jerusalem, Mark makes the comment that he said all of this quite openly. But now, there's going to be a little more information that he shares, and um, now he wants to take this privately with his disciples. So, what we want to do now is compare the first disclosure in chapter 8 to the second disclosure in chapter 9, and in a couple of weeks we'll compare the first and second disclosures to the third disclosure. Okay? So in chapter 8, verse 31, it says, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. In chapter 9, the Son of Man is to be betrayed in the human hands, and they will kill him. And after three days, uh, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. So you can see some similarities here, particularly in this title, The Son of Man. So we'll look at that in a moment. Um, and in the first disclosure, uh, he says he, he's going to undergo great suffering. We don't have that in the second disclosure. Um, instead, in the second disclosure, it says he'll be betrayed. Both of them say that he'll be killed. And uh, the first disclosure names specifically the elders, the chief priests, the scribes. And in the second disclosure, it's all about human hands human hand. So it would seem that in the first disclosure there is a kind of a targeted audience of, of those who are perpetrating this act, but in the second disclosure it's a little bit more of a universal claim. And uh, perhaps it's pointed at the readers or the, the people around us. Um, but that's interesting. We've got two disclosures now, very similar, certainly. Um, Similar also in that Jesus is speaking of himself as the Son of Man in that third person voice. And that's a curious thing. Um, it actually irritates me a little bit when people talk about themselves in the third person like that. But in the Gospels, that's how Jesus chooses to disclose his forthcoming death. So, what we have here, I'm going to get it all up there, <clears throat> are three different... Uh, ways in Mark's Gospel how this term Son of Man is being used. So before we look at that, let me begin by reading for you a little bit out of Daniel chapter 7. Okay? Now if you've read my book, Left Behind and Loving It, you would know that 
as I understand it, the book of Daniel is really two different books. Uh, chapters 1 through 6 seem to be about an historic Daniel. Chapters 7 through 12 um, seem to have been written much later, probably uh, around the same time as the book of Enoch and Maccabees and those intertestamental books. Um, Daniel's very different in the second half, uh, but he's still a visionary. And in chapter 7, Daniel is having a vision. And I'm just going to read part of it, starting with verse 9. As I watched, thrones were set in place, <clears throat> and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed from his presence. Thousands, thousands served him, and ten thousand, ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. I watched them. I watched them because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking and as I watched, the beast was put to death, and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. But their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched the night visions, I saw one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. So what we have in the book of Daniel, the second half of Daniel, which very obviously is, is the basis of many parts of the Gospels and particularly the book of Revelation. But what we have there is Daniel's vision of, it's really an anti-imperial vision. According to Borg and Crossan, this is an anti-imperial court scene where all of the great dynasties have laid claim to their power and one by one they're slain or taken down and their power is taken away from them and then suddenly this figure, like a son of man, some... Uh, Translations don't have it that way. They have uh, a human one, which um, if you translate the Aramaic phrase son of man, it could conceivably be translated a human one. But it does seem that this phrase son of man is grounded in certain texts in the Old Testament, and it seems to be one that no one expects to receive kingship because he's not arrogant and he's not powerful, he's not militaristic, but rather he's, he's the chosen one. And given from the book of Daniel, this is a phrase that Jesus uses. It only comes out of Jesus' mouth in Mark's gospel, and it's the way Jesus always talks about himself when it comes to his death. I did read an article years ago that suggested that Jesus was talking about someone else being the Son of Man. And... Um, in the end, after playing with that idea, the author finally concluded Jesus wasn't. Um, but they were just trying to pick up on that third person use there. But Jesus appropriates this role for himself. It's a phrase we do see in the Psalms on, on occasion, and it's a, it's a title or a role that's often associated with the suffering servant, as opposed to a title like Son of David, Messiah, Christ, Son of God, or something like that. So this is very unique for Jesus to appropriate this title for himself. But he does so in three ways. He talks about the Son of Man having power to forgive sins or to say to, to a paralytic, stand up and walk. That happened in chapter 2. In all three of his disclosures, uh, we're going to see that uh, Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man to talk about his suffering and death. And then, also, there are times when Jesus will use that phrase to talk about the Son of Man coming in power, which is also language he's going to get from the book of Daniel, chapter 9. So, we've got, uh, we've got a, a clearly um, a very pregnant term here that Jesus appropriates for himself. 
and it's unusual and the disciples hardly ever seem to catch on to that they don't quite understand what the emphasis on son of man is as opposed to son of david messiah son of god and they don't quite understand what the suffering and death is about and we'll see that in the very next verse but they were not understanding they were not understanding the word or the teaching and were fearing to interrogate him so this is not the first time we've seen the disciples not understanding right and i've been using i've been using references to chad meyer's work to richard horsley's work and some people would argue and and borgen crossing quite often some people would argue that they are more extreme commentators i i i think that's silly um but i want to read something for you from lamar williamson writing an interpretation uh commentary uh, i had lamar for a couple of classes and i've worked with him before uh, grading ordination exams he's passed away not long ago he was a very very good man and um Look what he has to say about the disciples' understanding. Early on, the disciples failed to understand the teachings of Jesus, chapter 4, although he repeatedly gives them private instructions. Their misunderstanding becomes increasingly evident in their response to his mighty works, and is summarized in Jesus' word to them at the end of the Galilean ministry, Do you not understand yet? Misunderstanding dominates the discipleship section, which he argues is 8 through 10 chapters. Um, Peter understands Jesus is a Christ, but rebukes him when he speaks of suffering and death. The disciples not only misunderstand Jesus' second passion prediction, which we just read, but their discussion about who is the greatest shows that they've not understood teachings about denying himself or taking up a cross. And then with the third passion position, uh, disclosure James and John request to sit at Jesus right and left hand in glory demonstrating their misunderstanding or rejection of his teaching that if anyone would be first of all they must become last of all and servant of all so it it's not just me folks uh, it's the gospel of Mark that shows that every time Jesus discloses his forthcoming death the disciples misunderstand and it's not understanding but it's also fearing fearing to interrogate fearing to come back fearing to understand fearing to probe it with jesus so it's not just a matter of the mind it's also a matter of the heart or the will that the disciples don't get it here the second disclosure and they don't get it and i'm going to argue that as it, as it goes on, we'll see how badly they don't get it. So now we get to verse 33. And they came to Capernaum. And beginning in the house, or being in the house, he was interrogating them, what were you deliberating on the road? You might remember that word, um, deliberating. We'll circle back to that. In, um, but it could be translated arguing, which is how the New Revised Standard Version put it. I was actually being nice uh, to the disciples about this one. But it does mean that they had a dialogue going. It's, it's the Greek term that it transliterates in English as dialogue. So they come back to Capernaum. This is the home for some of them. Uh, we know that in the early stories, Jesus came to, um, to the Sea of Galilee, he called Simon Peter and Andrew and then James and John then they went into the synagogue in Capernaum and then went to Simon's house where Jesus raised his mother-in-law so it would seem that Capernaum is where um, Simon Peter Andrew James and John live so just be mindful that they've been on this journey with Jesus and now they're coming back home and there is a reference in um in one of the the chapters it says and he came home again and it doesn't say where but it doesn't appear to be nazareth because you might remember that his family come to get him when he's there um and pretty soon thereafter they're back on the shores of the lake of sea of galilee that that's not near nazareth nazareth is down in judea <clears throat> 
so it would seem that um, that Jesus is, uh, has made Capernaum per, more or less his home. I don't know if he's moved into the family home of Simon and Andrew or, or where exactly. But now they're back home. And uh, that might explain why there's a kid around in a couple of verses. Um, but here he asks the question, right? What were you deliberating about on the road? So, Mark didn't tell us they were arguing on the road. This is just an indirect way that we find out that after the disclosure, as they travel to Capernaum, there's a bit of a row going on among the disciples. But, they were being silent. For they were discussing another version of that word dialogue. They were discussing with each other along the road, who is greatest? So, the diagolizomai can be translated deliberating, discussing, arguing. Um, it, it comes up in two different verses in two different forms, so very related forms. Um, so, there's a hot argument going on here. And the question is, either who is the greatest? Could be what is the greatest? It could be what is greatness? So, just keeping in mind, Jesus said whoever would be greatest must become least of all. That seems to have kicked it off. So Jesus has disclosed that he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to rise on the third day, and he argues that whoever would be greatest must become least of all, and now they're arguing either which among them is the greatest, which is how it looks, or perhaps even what what's left of the word greatness what does it mean to be great if you're going to, if jesus is going to go die and i want to argue that this is not a theoretical argument for them but rather the disciples have a different view about what jesus should be up to and it does not include going to jerusalem and dying so this argument here is an argument about what is greatness what does it mean what what does it mean for the son of man what is that? Or even what is that title? Is that a great title? It doesn't seem to have this cachet of some of the other titles we can think about. Um, so they have that heated argument going on. Either who's greatest or what is greatness. And having sat down, he called the twelve and is saying to them, if any wants to be first, that one will be last of all and servant of all. So you might think he's already talking to the 12, but remember they just got home. Some of them are probably out greeting family or, or preparing or something like that. But he calls the 12 together. This is the teaching in the home. The teaching in the home. When we get to the last story of our semester about Bartimaeus, we're gonna look at two, two phrases. One is on the way and the other is in the home uh, or in the house. Um, there are two really important locations for Jesus' teaching in Mark's Gospel. Okay, in verse 36 now. Having taken a child, he placed her in their midst, and having embraced her, he said to them, let me stop there now. Um, now, I have her. You, you can't really tell the gender or the age of this child from the text, so I'm making it a girl. And um, he embraces her. There's going to be an interesting connection between embracing, holding, welcoming. I think all of these are rather um, related terms in this verse and a few verses that follow. And you might be asking yourself, where did this kid come from, right? Um, but remember, we're now back home. And we know that Simon has a mother-in-law, so it stands to reason that the rest of them have spouses, children, and extended family. And here they are, they're home, and here's a child. And Jesus uses this child as a, in a moment to preach something about what it means to be great. He's answering the question, what is greatness? Having embraced her, he said to them, whoever would hold one of these children in my name holds me. And whoever holds me does not hold me, but the one who sent me. So we've gone from embracing to holding, and in a minute we'll go to welcoming, which I want to argue are all extensions of the same motif. And what we see is a radical identification. 
first of all, between Jesus and a child. Now, when we think of children, you know, we think of these lovely little creatures who steal our hearts, and we just love for them to be among us doing cute and beautiful things. But don't forget, we're just one or two generations removed from people who said children are to be seen and not heard. We're just one or two generations removed from people that did not allow children to speak at the table. It, it has not always been the case that children were either welcomed or allowed as children to be in adult company. And quite often they were sent off for boarding school. Quite often they were just kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and in the New Testament era, like it or not, uh, a child was really considered among the lowest rungs of being in, the, uh, in society. You, you liked men, you liked wealthy men, uh, men of power, and so forth. And after you got through all the men and the servants and so forth, then you get to the women. And, but even well below women then were children. They weren't contributors to society, they were needy, they were this, they were that, they were work, and all of that. Um, so, the fact that Jesus picks up a child and says, you hold this child, you're holding me, he's demonstrating what it means to embrace greatness. And that is to take the one who's considered the least among you, and to welcome that one, and in doing so, you are welcoming Jesus, and in doing so, you are welcoming God. Um, this is not far different from the parable in Matthew 25 that says, Inasmuch as you do this to the least of these, you've done it to me. That same idea is holding here. So that's the end of the first pericope. It begins with them going to Capernaum, or going through Galilee, and with Jesus disclosing that he's going to the cross, they don't understand, they're afraid to ask, and they start arguing about what is greatness or who is the greatest. A, a totally inappropriate response to Jesus' second disclosure. Just like Simon Peter's rebuke of Jesus was a totally inappropriate response to Jesus' first disclosure. And now we've got the disciples are two for two in hearing about the forthcoming suffering and death of Jesus and responding inappropriately. So, now we're going to move to the second pericope, which as I say is, is very related, but, but separable if we want to do that. And I want to start with a couple of notes. First of all, if you look in your Bibles, you'll probably notice that verses 44 and 46 are missing. Unless you have like a King James Bible or the, the, the Living Bible or something like that. Um, because the, the more reliable older manuscripts, many of which weren't discovered when the King James was printed in 1611, um, they do not have these two verses. So it seems like some copyist entered these two verses. And what's in verses 44 and 46, probably buried in your footnotes, annotation, uh, is basically verse 48. So it's, verse 48 is repeated ahead of time. I call that prepeated. Um, so what does come in the oldest manuscripts in verse 48 were then added as verses 44 and 46 in some later manuscripts. I, it's a difficult verse, and you just get the feeling somebody was really feeling it, so they just repeated it a lot. Um, so I think we ought to keep this edgy, these, the, this second pericope. And what I may mean by that is, let's not separate these topics too much. Remember, Jesus just told them he's going to die and rise again and they just responded inappropriately, and Jesus is setting them straight. If you want to imagine Jesus sighing heavily when doing this, rolling his eyes, wanting to say again, oh, you stupid generation, how long must I dare you up? Then you're probably not wrong, because Jesus just disclosed for the second time that he has to go to Jerusalem, and now they're two for two in responding badly. So, 
I would say that in the next pericope, the next stories that we're getting ready to read, that it's still edgy and a very tense situation. So we're going to hear some terms that are somewhat vague here. You're going to hear about Gehenna. You're going to hear about salted with fire. You're going to hear about a worm that never dies. Um, a lot of these are, are terms that were that had some valence in the first century about what's happening in the afterlife. So remember that for most of the Old Testament, there's really not any mention of the afterlife itself. Um, people were died, people died, and if they had lived a good life, they were honorably buried. And that's how you honored somebody who had lived a good life. It really wasn't until about the second or third century before the birth of Christ that um, this notion of the afterlife really took hold among the Jews and then the early Christians. And a lot of it was influenced by Greek philosophy, Platonic and Socratic philosophy. Um, and particularly when you start to see in the late first, more the second and third century of the common era, the reference to the immortality of the soul. That's not even a biblical concept. That's a Greek concept um, that this notion of the afterlife morphed into in the church's history. So you're going to hear some terms, and they're, they're terms that would have meant something to Mark's audience, Mark's Gentile audience, um, but they're not terms that you're going to see a whole lot in the Old Testament, so there's not a whole lot of Old Testament roots to these terms. This is fairly new theology, okay? Um, and then a question I think we can ask, and I think this is an important one, and I'm sorry for the, uh, the German term here, but uh, the question you ask is, what is the Sitz and Leben of the text? In other words, what is the text addressing for the reader's life? What's the situation in life? That's a translation of the phrase that the reader is facing that the text is written to address. And that's an important, I think that's an important question here, um, where we're going to go back behind the text and think about something that Mark's community might be facing. And I'll spell that out a little bit as we start. Um, and, and finally, let's just notice also, this is a very long discourse. Uh, this is 13 verses. And in Mark's gospel, you know, things are usually given at a clip and done. You have like one major parable in Mark's Gospel about the seeds and the explanation of the seeds. That's the long teaching discourse. And this is like uh, another relatively long teaching discourse. And then the 13th chapter will be the final long teaching discourse. So be prepared for that. So here we go. Um, again, revi New Revised Standard Version. John, the disciple John, no, not John the baptizer, who is dead. Uh, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. That is a... Um, that's a very, very com uh, interesting comment. Um, so when John says this to Jesus, it's not the, it's not the common word for saying, lego, uh, but rather it's more for one that John is uh, disclosing something, confessing something, um, and it's in the imperfect tense. So in some respects, this seems to be coming back at Jesus for all the stuff Jesus has just said. Okay? They have this conversation about what is greatness, an inappropriate response to Jesus' disclosure. Jesus tells them, if you're going to be great, you embrace a child like this because that's what it means. You, you embrace the least. You become the least in order to become the greatest. And now John seems, I would say, the way Mark frames this, is pushing back, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. Um, pay attention to this phrase. Uh, sorry. Pay attention to this phrase in your name. It's going to appear here 
We've already seen it, one, when Jesus says, whoever holds a child, embraces a child in my name, it's going to come up again and again and again and again and again throughout this text. So you want to ask yourself, what does it mean to do something in the name of Jesus, to embrace a child in the name of Jesus? What does it mean that this person, who we don't know, was casting out demons in the name of Jesus? And if this person is genuinely casting out demons in the name of Jesus, why did they want to stop him? Why did they want to stop him? Um, listen, if my perspective of the Gospel of Mark is anywhere near correct, and what you've heard from me week after week, I've been arguing that Jesus didn't want admirers. He wanted fellow workers. That following Jesus is more about participating in what Jesus is doing than it is about adoring Jesus. The reign of God is at hand. Change your way of thinking and trust in it. I think the whole point of Jesus' ministry is to gain people to start doing as Jesus is doing. And if that's the case, here's somebody doing it. Somebody who's living into what, what I think is Jesus' whole message so far in the Gospel of Mark. And what happens? The disciples try to stop him. So remember when I said we're going to ask about what the Sitzim Leben is of this text? Uh, the situation in life could be, bear with me, could be that Mark's community is living into the reign of God and that the disciples, the church led by the disciples, which is actually headquartered in Jerusalem, not in Galilee and not in the Gentile area where Mark it seems to be writing, is trying to stop them because they're not one of us. That's a very peculiar thing, isn't it? Um, how many disciples of Jesus are out there that the disciples in real time would have said, they're not one of us? I don't know. But it does seem that at least part of what we're looking at is in Mark's time, he may have a community that is doing marvelous things in the name of Christ, and boom, their biggest obstacle is the church led by the disciples. You see what I mean with that? So, um, and John uses the language, he was not following us. It's a very subtle shift from following Jesus, right? And, um, and maybe what that what that signifies is that Mark is writing about the church that follows the disciples as opposed to someone acting in the name of Jesus. I'm just going to suggest that this might be a glimpse, a glimpse into part of the dynamic of Mark's community, which is why Mark is so critical of the disciples. Verse 39, But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me. So that's that interesting phrase in it, to speak evil of me. Um, this may possibly be what John or the disciples are fearing here, is that someone does something in the name of Jesus, but then later speaks evilly of Jesus, perhaps equating themselves with Jesus or trying to usurp Jesus or something like that. I don't know. It seems that in John's mind and the disciples with him, you've got a rogue demon caster here that it's their job to put away. And um, Edward Schweizer, in his commentary remarks, said it actually was an acute problem in the early church that there were a lot of ecstatic prophets doing miracles in Jesus' name, but they were outside and not inside the established disciple-led church. So this might actually be a real um, ongoing uh, existential problem that the early church was facing around the time Mark was writing Mark's Gospel. Um, if nothing else, this is a very powerful validation of a community that's been othered. They're not us. Nonetheless, what they're doing in the name of Jesus is not lightly done. They're not going to be able to do that 
great deed of power in the name of Jesus and very quickly turn around and speak evil of him. And then Jesus says this, pay attention. Whoever is not against us is for us. I'm sorry for saying pay attention. I shouldn't talk to you like that. Um, I was talking to me. Pay attention. Whoever is not against us is for us. This may sound vaguely familiar to many of you. But I want to notice that um, a couple of things. Jesus picks up on the language of us that, <clears throat> that John had used when he said they weren't following us. That's interesting. Um, and while this may sound familiar, I'll bet most of us have heard it expressed differently. Because it appears several times in the New Testament, and each time is somewhat different. So let's compare all three of these, okay? In Mark, he who is not against us is with us. Pay attention to the prepositions. In Luke, he who is not against you is with you. Same saying, the pronouns are changed, but the prepositions are the same. But then look at one place in Matthew and one place in Luke. He who is not with me is against me. And notice the inversion of the prepositions there. So in these two, the thing is, if somebody's not actively against you, you can assume that they're with you. That's a very gracious statement. And in this one, if somebody's not actively with you, you can assume they're against you, which is, I think, in many ways, a very exclusive statement. And honestly, many churches that tack toward this tend to be more open and inclusive, and many churches that tack toward this expression tend to be more exclusive of others. Um, You've got four possibilities here, and I would invite you to tack toward these two. But that's going to be up to you. Um, in Mark's Gospel, even though it's kind of skirted off to the side there, he who is not against us, picking up on the us language that John had, is with us. So the point that Jesus is making is, look, if he's doing it in my name, then why are you prohibiting him? And it could be that in Mark writing this to his community, the point that Jesus is making to Mark's community is, hey, the disciples have no, the, the other church, the official church, the Jerusalem-based church, cannot tell you to stop acting in my name. Or it could be written to the Jerusalem-based church, look, they're not against you, they're with you. Um, and now we have the teaching. For truly I tell you, Whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink because you bear the name of Christ. Remember I told you in the name of Christ shows up again and again. Because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. So we heard in verse 37, 38, and 39, now in 41, reference to being in the name of Christ. And this, make, this means that someone can act as an emissary in the things that they do, whether it's holding a child, or welcoming somebody, or sharing a cup of cold water, or casting out a demon. It can be done in the name of Christ, which means that we are emissaries, and if you circle back to what we just heard a moment ago, anyone who accepts such a person accepts Jesus, and anyone who accepts Jesus accepts the God who sent Jesus. Um, The, the Eng, uh, English Standard Version, a relatively newer version that came out, changed this from bearing the name of Christ to be, because you belong to Christ, which is not a bad way to think about it. I think it's a bad way to translate it because you start to lose the uh, connection between all the other verses and this one. But if you're wondering what it do, means to be in the name of Christ, I, that's not a bad way to think about it. You belong to Christ. Um, and then verse 42. This, I feel, is probably really spoken to the church in Jerusalem about Mark's Gentile community. But if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Um, this phrase, stumbling block, is literally the Greek word scandal. 
scandalizo, um, and uh, scandalize, all those words, uh, this, is, this is the root from which they come. Uh, if you are scandalized, if you scandalize one of these little ones who believe in me, you're better off sinking to the bottom of the sea. Um, this will be the first time we see this word, scandalize, over the next few verses, so I want you to pay attention to that, how you can be scandalized. Um, one way you can scandalize others is to stop them when they're acting in Jesus' name, and like the disciples were trying to do with this demon caster. It's better for you to die than to do that. That's what Jesus is saying. Um, the next verse, if your hand causes you to stumble, if your hand scandalizes you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. All right, let's stop for a second there and just work through some of these terms, okay? So again, this stumble is a scandalized word, okay? How is it that your hand can cause you to stumble? I'm not entirely sure, right? I think our hands are, are more or less just extensions of what our minds tell them to do. So it's, it's hard for me to imagine how a hand can cause you to stumble, and then you, the person thinking behind that hand, can cut the hand off, and then you won't be stumbling anymore. Um, so I want you to imagine that we're probably using this metaphorically, and I want you to imagine that um, a very popular use of the metaphor of the human body in the first century, we know this from reading Paul's letters, is to refer to the body of Christ as one body with various parts. And if one of those parts is the hand, and if that hand is causing the rest of you to stumble, better to go without the hand and to have that hand and for the whole body to fall. So this is a very, if Jesus is talking about that part of the church that's trying to suppress Mark's community, then that's a very harsh word to them. Mark's community is better off without you. Better for them to continue acting in the name of Christ and giving out a cup of cold water and casting out demons and, and welcoming the little ones in my name, doing all of this in my name, than to continue to be connected to you if you are going to cause them to stumble. You see how this is a really, really um, searing indictment in some ways. Um, one thing that's curious about this, I never really noticed this until I read an article recently about it, that um, this verse suggests that if your hand gets cut off, then in the afterlife, you're still going to be handless. I never heard the afterlife described like that. Um, better to enter life maimed than to keep both hands and end up in the unquenchable fire. The word unquenchable there is literally in Greek asbestos, fire. That's where we get our word asbestos. Um, the word hell there is the word Gehenna, which uh, is rooted in this valley of Hinnom, which was, this is what I understand anyway, was a kind of constantly burning pit where they would throw their um, trash and basically keep it burning so it's a trash pile that's ever burning and kind of known to be a place where disease and all manner of, of, of evil things happen um, so that was an imagery that the first century seemed to have known um, again a lot of language here about the afterlife or the entering the life which probably would not have been known among the jews four centuries before, but around the second century before Christ, um, the confluence of Jewish theology and Greek uh, philosophy and mythology started kind of producing a very fertile imagination and very fertile theological time, uh, a good one in many respects, and it's from there that we get a lot of the language about the afterlife that's been shaped for the New Testament. Um, 
So here we have a hand that can cause you to stumble better to cut it off, even if it's both of them, than to continue on. Or if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Better to enter life maimed, lame, than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. Again, you know, the question arises for us, how could a foot possibly cause, I mean, I, you can be caused to stumble if you trip on something, but it's not the foot, it's the rock, right? Um, how can a foot be a stumbling block, a scandal for you? So again, this is bodily language being used metaphorically, just like the Apostle Paul did when he talked about the body of Christ as one body with many parts. And the eye. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. Better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. All right. Now, with the eyes, we might have a lot more appreciation for an eye that causes us to stumble because we talk about a wandering eye. We talk about the green eye of envy. Um, sometimes we use language like that, that the eyes are, are, are kind of difficult, just like sometimes we speak of the tongue being a difficult member to kind of bring under submission. Um, maybe in antiquity it was, it was common to speak of all of our body parts like that, as opposed to just the wandering eye or the loose tongue. Um, maybe they thought that, you know, people that steal, they blame it on the hand. People that run away or go into the wrong places, they blame it on their feet, something like that. Um, so, we get a reference then to being thrown into hell, Gehenna, and then there's this phrase, where the worm, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. That's verse 48. Those are the words that some copyists repeated in verses 44 and 46. Uh, they're not in the earliest manuscript, but somebody just thought that was powerful and added them. And, um, and so every time you see a reference to hell, you would get that little description attached to it in some of the later manuscripts. Um, I don't know what the plural there is all about. Um, going into hell, Gehenna, we're there, worm. I, I don't know exactly what that's about. I have to say, this part of this chapter loses me quite a bit, but, but it's easier to imagine if I hear it as Mark presenting Jesus' message in a way that defends Mark's community against the Jerusalem church. And then the last verses. <clears throat> For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt had lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Okay, we seem to have a whole new topic being introduced here for the last couple verses, and you're probably tired of listening to the presentation. You're probably tired of reading this chapter. So what we're gonna do is just hang on to this verse and talk through some of the implications of what it might mean in our Wednesday night discussion. So, do you wanna come join us? Uh, we will be at um, 7 o'clock Wednesday night, October 7th, um, and I would love to see as many of you there as can be there. Thanks.